everybody, and welcome. My name is James Nevius, and I'm happy to uh, to welcome you here for this inaugural talk in a new series with the Raider Galleries, In Perspective, Small Bites of the Big Apple. What ties the six images that we are going to be talking about today together is that they are all currently on view at a Raider Galleries at 1016 Madison Avenue. So what uh, this is all really about, this is essentially a gallery talk, but rather than be in the gallery, we're all at home. But if you are in New York, I'm going to say this now and I'll say it throughout and I'll say it again at the end. I highly recommend that you go in and see these prints for yourself after you've learned a little bit about them because they are magnificent and uh, you can spend some time with them and uh, go home with one if you're interested. So let's, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my wife, Michelle, and I have uh, been New York City walking tour guides for a number of years. We've written a number of books about New York City. These are the two big books, uh, Inside the Apple, A Streetwise History of New York City, uh, which came out about a dozen years ago from uh, Simon & Schuster and is still in print, and Footprints in New York, Tracing the Lives of Four Centuries of New Yorkers, which is a collection of essays tracing the history of the city through the eyes of the people who lived here. And they're both, they're complementary titles. I highly uh, encourage you to check them both out. So, as I said, what we are going to do is we're going to look at six prints. Uh, these two from the late 18th century, which show different views of New York City, and then a couple of street scenes from 1836, uh, two very different street scenes, but both from the same uh, basic year, and then two bird's eye views of the city. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to do, is those uh, six prints. So let's start by going to what is probably, you know, uh, the oldest. Let's go back to the 18th century. Zoom in just a tiny little bit so that we can see this better. Uh, this is a view, as it says at the bottom, of a southwest view of the city of New York in North America, drawn on the spot. Let's see that a little better. Drawn on the spot by Captain Thomas Howdell of the Royal Artillery and engraved by P. Cano, that is Pierre Charles Cano, who was a French-born engraver he spent his entire career, uh, or at least the important part of it, working in London. Uh, he was not someone who had ever been to New York. So uh, that explains perhaps some of the, call them inconsistencies, uh, incorrect items. Uh, if you look, this is the key at the very bottom of the print. And the things that the seven things they are pointing out to you in this print are the harbor, Nutting Island, which is what we today called Governor's Island, Staten Island, Long Island, the Rutgers House, which we'll talk about in a second, the South River, and the Brew House. Well, here's the thing. There's no South River in New York City. Uh, what it is actually pointing out, and uh, let me just get my laser pointer here. This is where it says South River. This is, in fact, the East River. Uh, and that's just a, an easy mistake to make. Uh, in the good old days, the river that went on one side of New York was called the East River, and the one that went on the other side was called the North River, uh, which we today call the Hudson. So thinking that the opposite of the North River should be the South River was actually a fairly logical mistake to make. So this house over here was the house of a guy named Henry Rutgers. That's him. Uh, he's the person that Rutgers is named after, uh, Rutgers University. And if you look... Well, sorry, this church uh, is near the spot uh, where his house is. So if you're familiar at all with the Lower East Side, uh, what you're looking at is the view essentially down Division Street. So if you look at the 1767 Ratzer map, Howdell and Ratzer probably knew each other. Uh, if you attended my talk about the Ratzer map, you're, you're very familiar with this image. Uh, this is Division Street, and what it did is it divided the land of the Delancey family from the land of the Rutgers family, and right in here is the Rutgers house. So you see it here. So this is probably Division Street running here. And then this is the Brew House, and it took me a little time to figure this out, uh, but the Brew House this is an ad from 1803 from the newspaper saying that there is a brewery for sale 
between Pump and Eagle Streets. So if you go back to that Ratzer, here's Eagle, which is uh, the extension of Hester Street, and today we call this all Hester. And then this is Pump, which today we call Canal. And the reason that they called it Pump Street was that it was where the fresh water or tea pump was. Uh, one of the problems of living in 18th century New York was the lack of running water, something we're going to talk about in just a moment. And so you would come up, and you can see that there's a fresh water over here, uh, from lower Manhattan to this part of town, to the tea water pump, to get your palatable, potable drinking water. Now, Howdell also did this lovely image here in color, uh, which is a southeast view of the city of New York in North America. And if you look at its captions, uh, it shows the new college, which is Columbia, the old English church, which is Trinity, City Hall, the French church, the North River, they got it right, Staten Island, and the prison. So, so far so good, except that is a palm tree. And you see this in 18th, 17th century even. Uh, you see v v images of old New Amsterdam, and you definitely see images around the time of the American Revolution where they take these palm trees and they plop them down. Uh, and it's not that Howdell was drawing a palm tree in that spot, it's that Cano in London was probably trying to spice things up. This is exotic North America, after all, and what makes everything more exotic is, of course, palm trees. Uh, that doesn't bother me. None of it bothers me. I find it all absolutely fascinating. Uh, this over here is the prison, and you can see I did a little close-up of it there. It's on the wrong river. Uh, it is Newgate Prison. Uh, it should be over... Uh, on the Hudson River side, not the East River side. So it is completely flipped. And what I don't know is whether or not this should be labeled something else, or if indeed this is supposed to be a picture of Newgate Prison. Problem here is it has two towers. Uh, and Newgate, as far as I know, had one. There was another prison down in the city called Brideswell, named after the they're both named after prisons in London. Bridewell had no towers at all. So that remains a bit of a mystery, but maybe we will revisit that at some point. Uh, if you zoom in, this is this is the important part of this print, is what they're focusing on. These two gentlemen that you saw in the print are, are lounging in Greenwich Village, and they are looking south towards the city. And this is Columbia, and this is Trinity Church, and this is City Hall and the French Church. Now, it's not the City Hall that you know today, if you're familiar with Lower Manhattan. That would be built in a few years' time. It is actually the old city hall on Wall Street, which after the American Revolution, this, these, these images are from just before the American Revolution, after the American Revolution, city hall was requisitioned by the federal government and became a federal hall. And so this is a very famous image of George Washington being sworn in. So um, it, it, as I said, it's a lovely print. There are these two uh, gentlemen. Uh, and the only other thing I want to point out is you sort of, these sort of rolling hills are geographically, geologically correct. Uh, what separated Lower Manhattan from what would become the neighborhood of Greenwich Village was uh, an area called the Sand Hills. And so making this very hilly, especially on the west side, is extremely appropriate. But let's jump forward in time uh, to look at a pair of prints uh, from 1836, and uh, these are sort of remarkable images of uh, a city in transition, uh, in particular because New York in 18, December 1835 suffered uh, what was in some ways the biggest catastrophe that the city had ever known at that point. A, a fire started in Hanover Square, and if you're familiar with the financial district, it's down sort of at the end of Wall Street uh, near the East River. Fire started probably in a printing house or a warehouse on Hanover Square, and it spread and engulfed much of the city below Wall Street. Uh, and if you are at all familiar with this, it is often that you see this. This is the Merchants Exchange on Wall Street, which, as you can see, was burned down. Uh, that is a very famous image. But what we are seeing in this uh, print by William Bennett, 
Uh, it is the view of the ruins after the Great Fire in New York, which was December 16th and 17th, 1835, as seen from Exchange Place. So this was Exchange Place, which is one block south of Wall Street, otherwise known as Garden Street. Uh, and it is based on an original painting, a gouache, by Nicolino Calio, who was this amazing Italian artist who came to the United States just before this. He started, I think he arrived in Baltimore, and then he made his way up to New York City just in time for this fire to engulf uh, Lower Manhattan. And I mean, the fire it wiped out a lot of the remains of the Dutch colonial city, the English colonial city. It, it in many ways forced New York into the modern world, for lack of a better term. And um, the reason I brought up wanting running water before is that we didn't have any. Uh, the Croton aqueduct system uh, happens after this in response to this so that uh, pipes can be laid and water can be brought into the city. Not so much for drinking. It's not to replace the tea pump. It was so that we could fight fires because in December 1835, one of the coldest winters on record, uh, they went to wells and cisterns and even the East River to get water to fight this fire and it was all frozen solid. Now, Calio did more than one view uh, down Exchange, down Garden Street. This is the other one. Uh, this happens to be from the Museum of Fine Art in Houston. Uh, and you can see when you compare the two images back and forth, uh, he's making different choices. I happen to prefer this image, which is the image on view at a Raider Galleries, uh, in part because it has more detail. But one of the things that's had to happen to allow that detail to be possible is if you look, if you compare the two, this is probably closer to the actual width of Exchange Place. And here, the, the, the figures are shrunk so that they can, it makes the street appear much, much wider. Um, also, they're just little details. Uh, here is grave markers in the churchyard of this was the old Dutch Reformed Church. And in the other image, they're gone. There's many more people on the street, uh, including what just appear to be tourists, looky loos, who are on their way to see the fire. This one, it's much more about the action of the firefighters. Uh, and there's much more going on. It's much harder to read in this. Uh, and many, as I said, many fewer people. Um, Calio did many paintings uh, of the fire, not all of them like on the spot. This was not in plain air. He wasn't just going down and doing documentary. He was sketching and then he was going back to the studio and there was a market for these. So he was creating them. Uh, there's a lovely view that he did from, uh, from New Jersey looking back at the city, which is also on view at a Raider Gallery. So I would have you check that out as well. So 1835 is the fire. 1836, 1837 <clears throat> is when these prints and paintings are being sold. Uh, and that is the same year that this print of Broadway, New York uh, comes out. It's uh, You can read the caption maybe a little better here. Broadway, New York, showing each building from the Hygiene Depot, corner Canal Street, to beyond Niblo's Garden. You can't actually see, I kept looking, you can't actually see Niblo's Garden in this image, uh, but you can see the Hygiene Depot. Um, and it, that might seem like a sort of strange, why, why this corner? Well, if you look down here, it's published by Joseph Stanley. That's the printmaker. And if you zoom in, What's below the branch of the British College of Health, which is the hygiene medicine, is Joseph Stanley. So the absolute centerpiece of this image is uh, a very nice representation of the offices of the printmaker who's selling you this print. Uh, this, this image is a riot of, of wonderfulness, and we could do an entire talk just on it. But there are a few things I pulled out. So first of all, this British College of Health, it sounds a, sort of extremely formal and must be uh, must be good. He, uh, no, uh, the guy who Morrison, who was making hygiene medicines, was a snake oil salesman. And these were pa patent medicines at best. 
but uh, a lot of the stuff that was being sold here was was pure quackery. But uh, he had a brand. He had a British College of Health that he established in London to sell his patent medicine, and a branch of the British College of Health that he established at the corner of Broadway and Canal Street. Uh, it, if we zoom in next to Joseph Stanley Publisher, uh, this is sort of interesting. It's the Lafayette Bank slash Coffee House. Uh, coffee House, a, an interesting sort of holdover from the good old days when coffee houses were indeed where things like the New York Stock Exchange were. Um, the Lafayette Bank was also another one that I had a hard time finding out information about because it didn't last very long. Uh, 1836, when this print, uh, when this image is capturing this moment, uh, is right before the Panic of 1837, uh, which is long and boring and I won't get into it, but the Bank of England raised interest rates. That meant American banks were raising interest rates and all sorts of places uh, were on not very sound financial footing. Uh, went out of business, including the Lafayette Bank. So it at best lasted uh, in this location for about 10 years, uh, but you, by the mid 1840s, you don't see any uh, any uh, trace of it. And what really pulled America out of this panic was the gold rush, 1848, uh, when suddenly it's not just paper money, but real hard currency to back it up. Um, the street life in this picture is what is so amazing to me. So let's just zoom in here. Uh, I do not, there's a lot of wood on the street here. They're obviously constructing something, but I can't tell what. Uh, I love this gentleman who is selling shoes from a pole that he carries around. Uh, this woman here is selling things. These, you'll see them outside. I'll go back a slide. You'll see all over these rails on the sidewalk. Uh, they are primarily there for you to tie your horses, but someone is using it to hang their goods as well, so serving a double purpose. Uh, Calio, the same man who did those paintings of the Great Fire, is well known for doing these little vignettes of people selling goods. These happen to be from the New York Historical Society collection, uh, and there's a whole series of them. Uh, the selling lemons and oranges and corn and uh, charcoal. And you can see on the street here, I don't know how well you can read that, that says spring water. So uh, again, the Croton aqueduct system is not in place yet. So you have to buy your water from someone who brings it door to door. This is the ice man. The ice man cometh there. Uh, looking at this scene, we've got more street merchants, uh, some women do done up in their finery. And this is the uh, Greenwich and Wall Street stage. Uh, so the only transit in New York at this time uh, were privately run omnibuses. There was no, there was no uh, public transit system. And so you can see in this picture, there's one. If we go back a slide, that's another almost certainly private omnibus carrying people to and from. And there were lots of them. They would cluster in Lower Manhattan. And it, that's called the Greenwich and Wall Street because it would start at Wall Street and it would take you up to Greenwich Village, probably uh, via a few stops here in what was the finest shopping district in the city at the time. Uh, I just wanted to point out, not all of these, uh, it's not just the older prints that have errors. This is the Lockwood Lockwood School Book Depository. It was directly across the street from the printmaker. You'd think they'd get it right. It says 415, which would be its address on Broadway. Uh, the Lockwood School Book Depository was actually at 411 Broadway. So I just find it fascinating that, um, you know, once you've got this engraved, uh, oops, you can't go back. The last pair of prints I want to look at are two different bird's eye views of the city. This is 1851 by a man named, it's drawn, printed, and published by a man named John Bachman. Uh, and it is the bird's eye view of New York and Brooklyn. It's a tinted lithograph. And it is an amazing moment uh, in time. And we'll just sort of zoom in here. These are remnants of the War of 1812, uh, which in 1851 was, of course, still very much in living memory for lots of people. Uh, you see this one, which you are 
probably familiar with but may not know that it was connected to Lower Manhattan by a bridge. That is what today we call Castle Clinton. It's where you buy tickets for the Statue of Liberty. It's partner over here was called Castle William. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of what they look like today. That's Castle William over here on the right and Castle Clinton on the left. Uh, they were uh, There were a number of fortresses built prior to the War of 1812 to protect New York Harbor. And as, I'll go back two slides. As you can see, New York Harbor is absolutely lined with ships. And that was obviously more in 1851 than in 1812, but New York is the deepest, widest, best protected natural harbor in North America, and it very well worth uh, defending. So we had castles everywhere. You can see that Castle Clinton, which was built on landfill in the harbor, is connected by this little bridge, and this is Battery Park. And then this is Bowling Green. So if you're familiar with Lower Manhattan, there's Bowling Green today. Still a fountain, it's a different fountain, but uh, the fountain was the southern ceremonial terminus of the Croton Aqueduct system, just trying to bring these things all together. So whereas in 1835, we'd had this tremendous fire, now here we are only 16 years later, we have so much water that a fountain can bubble up all the time. Uh, if we go far, so here's uh, Bowling Green, we go farther up Broadway, there's Trinity Church, the, the so-called English church in that uh, slide. There's a nice picture of Trinity. This building uh, with the columns out front is what today we call Federal Hall National Memorial. It stands on the spot where Federal Hall once was, but this was actually built to be the United States Customs House. And then if you look here you see a building with a dome, and that building still stands, but you can't see the dome because at the end of the 19th century, McKim, Mead, and White built a second story up here covering it, but it's now Cipriani, Wall Street. And if you go inside for an event, that dome is still very much there and you can see it from the inside. So what's missing from this picture, uh, which is the whole reason that this next print, doo -doo -doo, gets printed is the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it's Courier and Ives. Uh, this is 1884, and the bridge had opened in 1883. So just to look at a little comparison between the two, this is Castle Clinton, Castle William, and this is from a slightly different and slightly forced perspective. That is not Castle William. That's something else built in Battery Park. But this is Castle Clinton, which as you can see in those 33 years, had just been totally subsumed into the park as it is today. This is Trinity. You can barely see in here Federal Hall. There's the dome still there. So they haven't covered it up yet. But as I said, the reason for this print is that the Brooklyn Bridge was the eighth wonder of the world. I mean, it was absolutely, it changed New York forever to have Brooklyn, the third largest city in the United States, and uh, New York, the largest city in the United States, connected. And it's not at all surprising that just a few years after this bridge opened, those two cities merged and became one. I don't know how well you can see this. There is a, uh, a church here. That's the church I showed you earlier. This must be Division Street. And so here it is, 130 years later. Uh, from what Division Street looked like in that first print. Just a couple of other things. This is the Bowery and Broadway meeting at 14th Street. And if we kick it over, 14th Street runs doo -doo 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 -doo, and across the river. And there's this fascinating, undeveloped portion of Hoboken. And in the middle of that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar at all with the Stevens Institute over there, but this was the old Stevens Mansion, now gone. And you can see the tower of it sticking up in the middle of these fields, which I think is kind of cool. And what I also think is cool is that as you head up there, here's Central Park. Uh, and if you, the last lecture I did, I know many of you were there for the Upper West Side. I think this really puts, uh, not to uh, pun too much, really puts into perspective how the city, you get, this is Columbus Circle, 59th Street. 
just kind of peters out. There's Broadway heading up into Morningside Heights, and then beyond this point, there'd be dragons. But you can really see how as late as 1884, they, uh, they just, the Upper West Side is like, is like a, a sort of vast wasteland uh, compared to, say, the Upper East Side over here, which is sort of well populated. And those are the six prints that I wanted to talk about in this very brief talk. So I have one question I see that's come in. Uh, how was it possible to get a bird's eye view in those days? Was there a perch? I know the answer to this sort of. I am also Michael Foley from a Raider Galleries is with us tonight. And, and uh, maybe he has an answer for this as well. But I know that in at least some cases there were perches. Uh, and I'm going to do another talk in this very same series, and it is going to involve a uh, a view from what's called the Ladding Observatory, which was a tower built in Midtown, and then looking down. I know that um, the man who drew that view of Canal Street was very... Um, well known for climbing, his name was Thomas Horner, and he was very well known for climbing up the top of things and doing these views. Well, I'm very curious about this uh, this courier in Ives, which really does seem to be sort of hot air balloon uh, view. Um, and quite honestly, there were plenty of uh, hot air balloons uh, going around in that era. Um, I was just reading a newspaper from 1879, uh, and everybody is hot to figure out when, um, hot to figure out why there was this hot air balloon floating around, and it's that I wonder if there was somebody up there sketching, madly sketching the city. It's quite possible, and it's, it's certainly worth investigating, but I've not seen any evidence that couriers artists specifically used that as a method, and you can see the the distortions involved in the image are pretty extreme. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is oversized uh, relative to its surroundings, and uh, they've straightened out the, the rivers and, and so forth. So I think there's, if the general concept came from uh, being aloft in a balloon, I think the majority of the work came from just sitting down with uh, imagination and, and good geometry. Uh, the next question is, is there a reason why the east side was developed more so than the west side early on? Um, part of the reason that the west side was not developed as much as the east side, um, one of the reasons that the west side was not as developed as the east side was that it has a tend it had a tendency to be rockier. It, it was literally harder to develop, and especially once you get north of 96th Street, you have uh, Morningside Heights, Harlem Heights, uh, now we or Hamilton Heights as we now call it, Dykeman Heights, and on and on you go. And New Yorkers of the 19th century could do a lot, but they could not necessarily uh, dig out all of that Manhattan schist as easily as they wanted to. So that is one reason why the West Side was harder to develop. Thank you. Someone is asking a question about this building right here. Uh, and asking whether it's a shot tower, and it 100% is a shot tower. It's on Beekman, it was on Beekman Street. And uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the way lead shot was made in the good old days was that you poured molten lead down from the top of a tower, and then it would hit water, and it would coalesce into a ball. And that's how you got shot. And so cities, lots of cities still have their shot towers, uh, I'm pretty sure there's one in Baltimore. Uh, uh, they, they, if you collect old postcards, they're one of those things that every city seems to sell a million different views of their shot tower, as if that's what, as a tourist, you needed to take home. But uh, New York's shot towers, at least in Manhattan, are long gone. So question is, it must have taken many, many occasions for the entire sketch to be so detailed. How long did that take to accomplish? Do you know the answer to that, Mike? I don't. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I agree that it must have taken forever. So I showed you this picture. I'm going to just bring it right back up really quickly. I love this picture of Broadway and Canal. And this was uh, it's a print made by this Joseph Stanley company based on a drawing by a man named Thomas, is it Horner? H-O-R-N-O-R, -O -O I think his name is. And he... Uh, it's kind of an interesting story how he gets to New York. He was run out of town in London. 
he was the artist in the 1820s behind a thing called the Colosseum, which went up in Regent's Park, which was not the Colosseum. It was modeled on the Pantheon. He obviously didn't know his classical history. And inside it was a the largest painting ever painted in the history of Earth, uh, which was a panoramic view of London. And he had gone to the tops of church steeples and had sketched everything he possibly could. And he and a member of parliament uh, invested heavily in this. It was going to be sort of the great tourist attraction in London. And when it, you know, people went, but when it failed, uh, he hopped on a boat and uh, fled to New York and lived out the rest of his life trying to eke out a living. Uh, and I can only imagine how many hours and hours, I mean, I've read about the Colosseum uh, before, and I have to imagine that it just took, uh, just took months to do the preparatory drawings, and, and who knows how long it took to actually, and they painted it twice, mind you. Uh, they painted it once, the, it failed, and then um, it, uh, they painted it again. Someone would like to see, were the peers public or private? The peers were private. I am not sure that the city, with a couple of exceptions, ran any of the peers. And the exceptions were like there was a fireboat pier uh, that was run by the city of New York. Uh, but I don't think that there were necessarily any um, publicly run peers. They were all companies uh, because, you know, New York was the largest uh importer and exporter of goods in the United States for a very long time. And so this was all private. So I would, uh, are any uh, Thomas Horner original works extant? I will pass that to you, Michael. I don't know the answer to that, uh, not off, uh, offhand by memory. I believe there are several, perhaps at the Historical Society, New York Historical Society, but I'd have to look it up to confirm that I'm right. So a number of people are saying that they're looking forward to um, seeing these in person. So I'll just reiterate that Madison Avenue between 78th and 79th Streets, uh, 1016 Madison Avenue. And uh, for those of you who joined me for the Ratzer map talk a few months ago, there is an absolutely magnificent Ratzer map in the ground floor uh, that is currently on view. And I would recommend highly that you stay there uh, and take a look at that. And then these New York prints are hung up uh, on second floor. I think it's the second floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Open from 10 to 6, uh, Monday through Saturday, and we'd love to see you. So please check them out and please watch your inbox. Uh, I'll be contacting you about upcoming events. Uh, and uh, we're going to do more in this series. As I said, I really want to do, there's a wonderful shot of the Crystal Palace. It's a print, and it is so detailed that I am, I'm starting to think that we'll just talk about that print and nothing else, because there's so much in it that as I was working on this talk, I'm like, well, you know, I could spend 20, 25 minutes just talking about it. So I think that's probably what we're going to do as our next one, and then we'll move on from there. So uh, please uh, join us in the future. And thanks to Raider Galleries for having me. Thanks, James. Pleasure as always.